Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service and welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar, part of our series of adult programs delivered differently. This morning, thanks to Affirm Press, we welcome international best-selling author, Anna Downs, whose best-selling debut novel, The Safe Place, was published simultaneously in Australia, the US and the UK in mid-2020. Today, she will introduce us to her much anticipated second novel, The Shadow House. Anna is joined today by Sydney-based author Ashley Kalajian Blunt. Her debut book, My Name is Revenge, was a finalist in the Carmel Bird Digital Literary Award and was shortlisted for the Wollara Digital Literary Award and her memoir, How to Be Australian, received a 2017 fellowship from the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Writers' Centre. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have into the Q&A or chat feeds on your screen and Anna will ask the, answer these at the end of her talk. Now, please sit back, grab a cuppa or glass of wine, and please welcome special guests, Anna and Ashley. Thank you so much, Tracy. And hello, everyone. I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And welcome everyone and welcome Anna. Lovely to see you here this morning. Lovely to see you as well. Hooray. Thank you um, for having me. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you City of Marion Library for, for having me on today. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you to, yeah, thank you to all the book lovers who are here with us this morning. I'm super excited to get to share this time with Anna Dance because not only is she an internationally published author, her books translated into multiple languages, but she is also a mom of two young kids. She's got a lot on her plate and it's just very, <laughs> very special to get to spend time with her and pick her brain about her incredible new book and her writing career and all things Anna. So, oh, thank you. welcome. Thank you. I was just going to say, speaking of the uh, the young kids, just a heads up that my five year old daughter is at home with me today. And uh, so if, if we do get a special guest appearance, just, you know, help me roll with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> Now you said that you sat her down and you talked her through what constituted an emergency in terms of this in terms of this time. Now, yeah. if I want a cookie, Anna, is that an emergency? It is not, Ashley. It is not. <laughs> it is not. But what she did say was she said, um, she said, what if um, what if a fire jumps onto the table and then spreads and then goes on to the cushions what's and I said yes that is an emergency so you know cookie no fire on the table yes okay okay that's a clear yeah. guideline toilet stuff is kind of in the middle that's like a gray area we work we we talked about that so we'll see what happens she, she, she might pop her head around the door who knows <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get into everything about the Shadow House, but first, I thought we could start. Uh, I'd love to hear about your early relationship with books and reading. So do you, do you have, you know, memories of when you were a young kid first learning to read, the first kind of books you fell in love with? Yeah, so um, my house, my family growing up, um, my parents, my grandparents, everybody, they were really big readers. Um, my dad is a real natural born storyteller mm -hmm. and so from you know as early as i can remember he would tell the most incredible stories all the time but particularly bedtime stories and uh, i specifically remember a lot of roald dahl but with all of the accents and full performances you know i'm kind of tucked up in bed and he's He's doing Danny, the champion of the world with these fabulous Birmingham accents and, and fantastic Mr. Fox. And I, I remember even now when I read fantastic Mr. Fox to my kids, I can smell roast chicken. I can taste like apple. I mean, at the time, obviously it wasn't cider, it was apple juice, but I, I have such visceral memories of my bedtime stories. Um, I started reading quite quickly, uh, quite young. I remember the first book I ever read by myself was a um, sort of like a little, do you remember those ladybirds? Or was that a British thing? Little ladybird thing. classics. Um, they, they were like uh, first reader versions of, you know, um, Alice in Wonderland and stuff like that. But the first one that I read was The Wizard of Oz. So I, um, 
that was the first one that I read by myself and I remember completing it and taking it downstairs and just went I just read a book <laughs> I have no idea what what age I was but I remember it being quite young um and then you know from then on as a child as a um adolescent at all ages I was always just you know the girl with her head in a book um my grandparents would tell me off endlessly for sneaking a book down to dinner and reading it under the table in in my lap um so always a voracious reader and and um a kind of lover of all genres I went through a huge fantasy phase when I was in my teen years uh, Terry Pratchett was like god to me I would um line up uh at his signings you know whenever he passed through town that was incredibly oh, exciting wow. uh, yeah yeah oh don't even talk to me because I had I, <laughs> I had a huge 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 collection of his books I had so many signed first editions of his work and Oh, no. My mum, no, no, my mum, when um, we moved when I was like nine or ten and she was like, you've got to get rid of all. Oh, no, no, this has got to be way after that nine or ten. I must have been like, it must have been when I went off to university and she said, look, I can't keep all your books in the house. You're going to have to get rid of some of them. And so I kind of not realising really the weight of what I was doing. I donated a whole bunch of them to charity. So I just really hope that wherever they are they're in a good home because I still <laughs> look back on that and go oh my god you stupid stupid person I was also really addicted to um the point horror series so I was really into okay. dark stuff from quite an early age so you know R.L. Stein mm -hmm. um and um oh gosh uh Christopher Pike mm -hmm. um and all those sort of you know uh teenage aimed uh, horror stories so I was addicted oh. to them I went through those kind of you know at a rate of knots excellent and we're actually we're going to talk about that uh, because I think that comes up that theme in in your writing in this book uh, so obviously you, you know you've always been a lover of books is it is it kind of magical now passing that on to your children like now that they're at an age where they're learning to read Absolutely. Oh God, I'm loving it. I love it. I, I, um, so I, for anyone who doesn't know my background at all, I used to be an actress uh, and I'm not anymore, obviously. And so uh, reading books to my kids at bedtime has become my sort of, um, outlet, <laughs> my performance outlet. So I am, I, I'm sort of, you know, carrying the torch past to me from my dad. So I do all the accents and, um, get really into it I love it so much and I love seeing their little eyes light up um, you know when a new like a plot twist comes in they go ah! or uh, you know when we find ourselves talking about a story that we read the previous night my current um, favorites to read to them are uh, Aaron Blaby's uh, The Bad Guys series so fun so fun so many kind of accent and performance opportunities but what's really cool is my son's addicted to audiobooks he's he's seven and so he is just obsessed with the harry potter books so we listen to them all the time you know the stephen fry read harry potter um series and it's just because i love that again i was um i remember being about 22 23 and lining up um you know when the stores open to go and get whatever the latest one was in that year I don't know but yeah I, oh. I love them so much uh so it's wonderful to kind of re-experience books with them and, and kind of see them discovering the joy of stories unreal oh, and I guess you have been able to take them to any book signings have have you because of COVID no there's not been any opportunity at all I mean it, it, I'm not sure outside of COVID how often JK Rowling might might stop through uh, the Central Coast. Um, <laughs> I think so. I took the kids to the Seymour Centre recently to see the uh, the Treehouse play. There's a, an adaptation going on there, a really good one um, of the 13 story Treehouse, and that kind of blew their mind. And I thought, oh, that's incredible. I think I think if my son had the opportunity to go and meet. Um, the authors of that uh, Terry Denton and um, the other one um, 
uh, Andy and Terry, if you ever got to meet Andy and Terry, he would be, I think, pretty blown away, but he's still quite young. Do you know what I mean? So we, I, I think even if we were allowed to go to signings, I'm not quite sure how impressed he would be. I think it really kicks in when you're sort of teenage and you, you kind of understand who an author is and what they do. Um, at least it was for me anyway, meeting Terry Pratchett. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah, so I, I believe it. Yeah, I grew up in a really small town. So we, like, I didn't even know that you could meet authors. That wasn't a thing that, and my parents also weren't readers. So there's like, there was a, there was a huge gulf that, but yeah, that sounds, that sounds like an amazing, I didn't know that. That's incredible that you met those authors when you're so young. It's been wonderful. It was like a, um, an author stalker. <laughs> <laughs> and we love those. We do love them. Love them, love them, love them. <laughs> Um, all right, so it's pretty it's pretty obvious that there was a lot of motivation for you in terms of your love of books to become a writer. But I wanted to ask you in your own words, what made you decide to write? Like you're obviously a very creative person, you're a storyteller, you used to be an actress, but what was it about writing specifically that made you want to sit down and dedicate the you know uh, serious time to actually become a writer? Oh, that's a question with a lot of different potential strands. Um, mm. <clears throat> I think, so what made me actually want to write words as opposed to tell stories in any other way was because I found myself in a period of, of my life where I'd, I'd left acting behind for a multitude of reasons uh, that I won't go into here, but um, I didn't have a creative outlet and the creative autonomy that comes with writing really appealed to me so it was more the appeal came more from being able to create on my own in my own space on my own time uh, whereas when you're acting you need collaborators and often you need permission in the form of employment uh, to to practice your craft so it's quite frustrating but um writing so much less so because you know you, you can do it whenever you like um and then it was but then it was just a hobby um uh, and then I think I think I just I just loved it so much and enjoyed it so much but it made so much sense to me you know the, the more I learned about how how to write a book how to use your words how to construct sentences how to plot it just made sense um and I was very spurred on by all of those things but why write why write at all why why tell a story at all um why did I kind of feel the need to create um anything at all you know fill fill that void with anything um I think comes primarily from a sense of awe you know that the awe that you get when you're a child reading Terry Pratchett or whoever uh, as a teenager, when you go to the theatre, um, as a young adult, when you encounter the first book that really sweeps you away and, and helps you understand who you are, that or for me, I wanted to roll in it and be in it and live in it and replicate that feeling for other people. Uh, then I think that or moves into kind of self-processing, self-discovery, self-excavation. It kind of moves inwards and you start thinking, well, you know, how specifically does it apply? Does this story apply to me? And oh my goodness, how interesting. Like I never realized I was this kind of person and this is why I do these things. Oh, wow. And you start through the writing. There's a real process of peeling the layers away and discovering yourself. Um, but mostly I think the appeal of writing for me is is just truth like when I was an actor we used to have this joke that you know that we always used to say like oh um I tell lies for a living ha 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 you know but you're not like as a storyteller you're you're telling the truth um and you're you're kind of acting as a conduit through which a particular truth even if it's just a personal truth is is brought to light um and I mean, as we know, words and stories are extremely powerful in terms of shaping ideology and, and identity. And I think, I think that with that sort of truth telling, you've got a real opportunity to bring something new to the 
global conversation to the you know to whatever conversation you you have an opportunity to kind of pick up a stone and see what's underneath it and show people and say look this this is new have you ever felt like that is this is this a thing um and often the answer is yes it is a thing and lots of other people feel that way and so they're you know you you, you have an opportunity to encourage people to feel those things as well i i um I don't know if you read, do you read Jess Hill's um, uh, See What You Made Me Do? You. Yeah, I haven't read it yet, but it, it's, yeah, it's on my list. Well, she, she says something in that, um, or maybe, oh, maybe it was an event that she was doing. I heard her speak about it and I've never forgotten it. And she said, you know, with this kind of stuff, like w with writing, um, you've got to, what does she say? She said, you've, you've got to make people feel this shit on a visceral level. You have to make their breath quicken and you have to make them feel like it's happening to them or to somebody that they know. And she's obviously, you know, talking about that in relation to domestic violence. And I'm not an activist. I'm not, I'm not Jess Hill, but I, I do think I've always really, uh, felt that responsibility keenly and, and, and gravitated towards it. I think it's a responsibility I take really seriously. Um, and, and it, it is one of the main reasons that I, I want to write. I think you, you know, to, to move past the cliches, to move past your own ego, to kind of join other like minds to, to say, look at the world and this thing that we've always known, but what's behind it? What, what is this in this corner? Do you, does that make sense? That's a really oh, long-winded answer. No, that's, that's amazing. That is incredible. And I agree with everything you said. And I think, I think writing and reading is a really just powerful, powerful act. Like whatever we choose to, to read and whatever we choose to write. There's an author in the United States, Sarah Santillas, and she talks about how when we, when we write, we remake the world. Yeah. And it's like even writing one sentence has the power of, you know, that, the, that act has the power of creating something new that can change things it so. really does and um I think that applies to everyone you know um it it might seem silly for a, a crime writer or a romance writer or any you know a genre writer to be saying to be speaking about writing on quite those levels but I think it you know whatever words you put down anywhere you have that responsibility you know they're, they're going to chime with somebody else and you have an opportunity to make those changes and to connect with somebody else uh, and, and yeah, and, and make a difference somehow mm -hmm. to someone's life, even if it's yeah. in a small way. Oh, I love that. Okay, well, let's talk about that in connection to The Shadow House. So this is your second, second novel, and I, you, know, you can feel that power in Anna's writing. You can feel the power of feeling things on a visceral level and feeling like her, her worldview and the, the world that she, you know, wants us to inhabit in in her in her beautiful writing and so just a quick if you haven't read the shadow house i'm assuming a lot of people have so but just in case there's people here who haven't no spoilers if you're asking questions which we love the questions keep them coming and i was going to answer them at the end uh but no spoilers please uh but just a little a little introduction to the shadow house if you haven't read it yet of course you have to because it's fantastic <laughs> um so it, it, is, it is about a single mother her name is alex and she she uh, lives in Australia. She's got one teenager and and a baby. She's got a very young baby. And she the book opens with her in the in the car with with her two children. And she has just arrived at this at this place. She's never been there before. It's an eco village. She's there to start a new life. She's escaping uh, a dark past, uh, an abusive relationship. She, she needs a place where she feels safe and secure and she thinks this community is going to be it. It's got this incredible charismatic founder. His name is Kit. He happens to be single. And so she's, she's trying to settle into this new place. She's meeting everybody. She's trying to figure out how she can make this place work for her. But of course, there's all these things going on underneath the surface and they start to be revealed. And I think the first page of this book really sets the tone. So if you could just read the prologue, actually. Oh, this yeah. Is, this, is the little, this is the little teaser before we actually get to Alex. So yeah, let's, let's, hear, let's hear the prologue. All right, yeah, cool. Um, okay, prologue, page one. The bones come first. A gift, but nothing wanted. Next, 
a doll, a likeness, a promise. And the blood marks the choice. It finds a face and then you know. Help, I need help. That's what he said, I remember it clearly. Voices in the night and footsteps, soft and slow on a carpet of green, on the grassy path that goes up to the blue sky and the diamond moon and the place where the birds fly north. That's where it happened. A noise, no, two noises, one after the other, first quiet, then loud. Oh, there was so much blood. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to help. I remember all of it, only then I forget. The rules, though, I won't forget those. Listen to me carefully, repeat after me. Bones, doll, blood. That's how it goes. Things arrive and then, a magic trick. Here one minute, gone the next. No one knows where he went. No one except the birds. They know, they saw everything. It wasn't his fault. It couldn't be stopped. Things arrive and then they take you. Oh, oh I love bum, that. Bum. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and part of the part of the intrigue of this book is who is speaking at that moment is, is yeah. who is who that is. And, and that just sets up this, this mystery, and this vibe that run through the story. And we start to get little insights into what this this person might be talking about. Uh, so at the core, though, of the shadow house, is this question of parental fear. This is really a book about Alex and her children. And I think this question of parental fear is, I suspect, what was driving you really when you were engaging with this book. And then I think this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the power of writing and reading to engage with real issues, even in you know a novel that's as gripping and beautiful as The Shadow House, there is this very real, these very real world questions going on under the surface. So. Did you start with that theme of parental fear and mind? And maybe you could talk a bit about that in terms of in terms of the context of the book, in terms of in terms of Alex and her two children. Yeah. Um, well, I guess um, it's important to note that it it was written sort of um, while COVID was kicking off and, and we were in lockdown, and and so I think there's a there was a whole lot of confusion and fear that was kicking around my body anyway which um, contributed to it. And, uh, you know, we're all going through such a, um, a significant time where we lurch from moment to moment. We don't know what's coming. There's no blueprint for this. Um, globally, that's the case. And I think that's a very fair um, and accurate de description of parenthood. You know, you, you, you have... You, you sort of have other people's experiences as a blueprint, but the, each person's experience and circumstances are so unique that there really is no blueprint. Each child is, is very unique. Um, I, early on when I was kind of coming up with the idea, I read a really amazing book um, by an American nonfiction writer called Kim Brooks, which is it's called um, Small Animals, Parenthood mm -hmm. in the Age of Fear. And it really struck a chord with me. Basically, um, it's an exploration of how we're living in an age of um, uh, risk and awareness of risk and um, how as, as parents, there are so many uh, social structures and systems in place um, and cultural expectations and new norms um, uh, that, that mean that we are very exposed, we are very judged, we're very critiqued, we are so aware of every risk that's involved in everything and, it, and it's making us crazy basically. Um, and it's also really counterintuitive in terms of um, you know, what, what we need to do personally within, within our own um, uh, family units for you know to, to help our kids thrive and, and to nurture them and to nurture ourselves and uh, as parents so it, it it 
it really struck a chord with me because I, I did kind of think, yeah, you know, I'm really anxious about everything um, when it comes to my kids. Um, I did have postnatal anxiety after the birth of my second child. It was largely, I think, um, to do with uh, kind of extreme sleep deprivation, but there was lots of other things at play as well. I think, you know, um, some of that was to do with uh, information saturation. You know, we're so, so aware of the horror stories all the time, you know, um, with a baby, you know, don't put, don't let them sleep in a particular way or they might die. Don't let them go anywhere near wires or they might die. As they grow up, don't let them eat these kinds of foods. They might have an allergy. Don't let them climb a tree. They might fall out and hit, hit their head. Don't let them do this. Don't let them do that. You know, um, and, and then I, I remember talking to lots of people um, about being a parent of teenagers. Um, and almost everybody was just like, oh, you think having babies is hard. You just wait. Oh, it's horrendous. And that just put the fear in, in you know, into me as well. And I'm going, you know, the, the reasons for that tended to be um, a kind of a, a very frightening loss of control um, in a world where technology is king you know technology was a big thing screens were a big thing um parents of my generation didn't grow up with the internet we, we embrace it but we don't fully I don't think we we don't fully understand it or at least not as well as our kids do they're learning to speak a different language that we will never speak and that that for me you know I started turning that over in my head over and over um and yeah, it just made me think how quite often the things that we do as parents to protect our children from perceived threats can often be more harmful than said perceived threat. Um, so it, it, it is an exploration of my, my own personal feelings. It's an exploration of the things that I've heard. It, it's an imagined reality. Um, for somebody that lives within particular personal circumstances. Um, it's an exploration of how Alex's fear meets the fear of other people as well. It's an exploration of how our stories are passed down, fear is passed down, and, and what that creates and how it kind of mushrooms. It, it can be a whole you know, a whole thing that, that starts from this very small concern that then becomes something much bigger. And then, of course, sometimes the perceived threats are real. They are real. There is kind of horrendous danger out in the world. And we do, as parents, need to be very careful. There is reason for the fear. It's not unfounded. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mean, as someone who does not have children, that having children is one of the bravest things you can do in the modern age. It's because it, it is. And and like you say, it's particularly because for people like us, I mean, we're relatively young, but at the same time, the, the context we grew up in, in terms of the digital world is so different from mm -hmm. what your kids are growing up in. And, and Alex actually addresses this. Uh, there's a there's a there's a conversation that she's having with Kit where she says, I didn't grow up with technology. I don't know it like he does referring to her teenage son. Uh, it's like he's this alien speaking a language that I don't growing up in a completely different universe. And yet I'm supposed to guide him through it. So Anna, talk to me about mystery boxes. What are they? Oh God. Yeah. So um, in the book, um, Alex's teenage son, she, be she becomes slowly aware that that he has these videos online that she didn't know about. And when she watches um, one of these videos for the first time, her 14 year old son is in his bedroom and he's speaking to the camera. He's, 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 you know, um, a YouTuber, um, providing a running commentary on this box that he has ordered on the dark web from a dark web marketplace using Bitcoin. And it's part of a trend, like a kind of a, a, a phenomenon that actually happened in, uh, 2017. It was really popular 2017, 2018, where, um, these teenage YouTubers, um, mainly boys, were um, 
sort of riffing on this unboxing theme that had started a few years ago with with girls who had been you know like beauty vloggers and stuff that would order mystery boxes from certain companies and these boxes would arrive they'd open them up live recording themselves going oh it's the new gucci bag oh my goodness look at the new iphone and you know there were also um you know toddler uh, versions of these where or maybe not toddler a bit older sort of five six year olds are opening toys my son was addicted to them when he was about three he was just like oh, I want to watch that one again and it's just kids opening presents opening toys and then playing right. with them right. so uh, it, it's something that was that was very popular but these boxes were from the dark web and these these kids so in the book, Alex watches her 14 year old open this box and say, I have no idea what this is. This has come from the dark web. Let's have a look inside. And he pulls out. Um, uh, I forget in the book the exact items that he, he pulls out. But um, with the YouTube videos, they were pulling out things like a bloodied screwdriver, a small bag of white powder, a flash drive, a ball of twine. Uh, some of them had, you know, underwear, strange pictures of um, you know, remote cabins in woods. Some of the, the the flash drives even contain these these videos that looked like they were being, you know, they were very dark and grainy, perhaps taken in a warehouse, and nobody could figure out what they were, but they seemed to tell a sort of narrative. Um, some of them even had like voodoo dolls. Some of them had nothing at all in them except for you know, just like. Uh, um, a wrench or something or a tool or a um it was very very strange and I watched loads of these videos going what is that and nobody knew about it and it was there were loads of articles in the news um people speculating as to what this could possibly be um so it was kind of legitimized by the media as well mm. um everybody was wondering what it was reporters went undercover to try and find out where these things were coming from oh interesting yeah and nobody could nobody could work it out um, and so in the book, Alex is is in the process of watching her son disappear down this kind of dark web rabbit hole. And she doesn't know what to do to help him. She doesn't know how to interpret it. She doesn't know what it means. She doesn't really know anything about the dark web. Um, yeah. So I'm going to oh. kind of leave it there because I don't want to stray into yeah. spoiler territory. Yeah, don't don't spoil anything. And that, I think, leads us right back to this sort of gothic horror vibe that runs through the book. So you are, you were a horror fan as a young reader. You're talking mm. about R.L. Stein. You read that prologue where we get that real vibe of, okay, something really creepy is going on here. So are you, are you still a horror fan now? Oh, love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I just, um, I love the adrenaline, adrenaline rush that you get from those sorts of stories. I love where your mind goes. And I think the, so, like the best horror writing um leaves a lot of space for the reader's imagination to fill in the gaps as well mm. and I really love that I love that interaction as a reader um I mean I I like I like kind of horror adjacent stuff where um the, the kind of the terror is just suggested I also like very explicit horror stuff where you're really shown what the horror is I love paranormal stuff love paranormal stuff um I think it's all it, it's always kind of the stuff that I love the most, though, it is quite subtle, um, again, with this suggestion of things that may be happening. And sometimes those things do turn out to be real. Sometimes it, you know, it is a ghost. Sometimes it is, you know, whatever. Um, and that can be incredibly satisfying, um, maybe just as satisfying as when it turns out to be perhaps something more human um but mm. I do I love the atmosphere I love feeling like I am the one creeping around the house looking into corners <laughs> you know I really love that I think the most one of the most powerful reactions I've ever had to a movie was uh, watching Paranormal Activity and, and Blair Witch Project as well um you know watching those movies um that try to um, present a paranormal situation as reality you know I could I 
I, I'm actually pretty good with, uh, like I'm not squeamish, pretty good with horror movies. Paranormal Activity, I had to turn off several times and read a magazine for a bit to calm myself down because it does that brilliant thing where it presents it as reality. Um, and I, I think that's really powerful. I really like that. Ah, I love it. I love it. And for 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 readers in the audience, the Shadow House definitely not a, is not a horror book. It's just got this. It's just got this vibe, this like little hint of things that you can mm. see where that comes from in turn of, terms of Anna's influence. And definitely, you mentioned that you you're you're a cross genre reader, and you can see that in in the Safe Place. You can see that in the Shadow House. And I think it really brings a richness into your stories. Ah, uh, so. We're going to open it to audience questions in about 10 minutes. So keep typing them in. I've got so many more questions for Anna. Now, you mentioned that, you know, uh, you, when your children are young, one of the things you experience is, is sleep deprivation. And Alex definitely, you know, she's got this young baby. She's kind of got the two hardest things. She's got the young baby and she's got the teenager <laughs> with the mystery boxes. But I think I think one of the things you do so well in here is that you write the baby. Her name's Kara, and she's she's just a fully fledged character. Like she, she doesn't talk, obviously she's a baby, but she's a, like a real vibrant, like 3D character. And I, I want to ask, was it cathartic to write her? Because at the time you were writing her, your children were not babies anymore. They were, they were a bit older. So was it cathartic to, to reflect on that experience of motherhood? All of my writing is cathartic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so much of it is, is processing my own experiences, but it's also, you know, listening to other people and imagining, um, what experiences might other experiences might feel like I think um with that's a, such a massive compliment thank you so much <laughs> I um I remember reading um Kylie Reed's such a fun age and there's a a baby in that book that I was like that is one she, she's one of the best characters I've ever read she was so brilliantly drawn and it made me think well within crime and thriller and mystery novels you very rarely have a, a, a mother character when the babies are there you know they're, mm. they're often hindrances and they are passed over so that the you know to someone else off that they're, they're off stage or they're given to the grandparents so that the protagonist can go on their journey but that to me didn't feel it didn't resonate with my own personal truth was which was that you 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 go on the journey and they're there all the time you know you you're you're trying to go on your own journey but you have to breastfeed and you have to figure out the nap math and you have to get bedtime right while you're doing all of this other stuff you know you've got all this personal turmoil going on inside you you're trying to forge your own way in the world as a as a human in your own right but you do also have this in, incredible responsibility but also that you know you're lost in the joy of it it's it's wonderful being a parent of babies like indescribably wonderful it's also indescribably difficult it's it's totally all-consuming and I, uh, I I I a yeah really wanted to make Kara feel like part of the cast but I also really wanted to show a protagonist who doesn't have any other support structures and who 100% has to get the job done. She has to get from A to B. She has to complete her character arc while breastfeeding, while getting up in the night, while pushing the pram around. You know, she's very much encumbered by Kara, but they're also, they're, they're the same person. You, you, can't, you can't separate them at this point. Kara's only eight months old. But I think also eight months... Uh, so my sister actually, interestingly, um, has a baby who is now, you know, eight, nine months old. And so I'm kind of watching her and it is the point at which the mother starts, is, is not ready to, to move on to their next chapter, but they start kind of feeling like them, you know, they, they might at some point go back to being who they were. You know, the, there's, there's, a, there's a pull or or like a, a longing for your your own identity that does get a bit a bit muffled by mm. parenthood if not gets taken away completely for some people so yeah very cathartic very fun very cool um and very important like I said that that responsibility to chime with other people and I think not just say to people uh, not not present a, a full healing or or a, you know like put a happy slant on it just to say I I I was there I felt it 
sleep deprivation sucks. And if you're going through it, I see you. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, her sleep deprivation is definitely a thread that runs through uh, and gets quite serious for Alex at certain points in the book. And so. has its own its own horror, I think. Mm. Mm. Okay, I have a question I really, really want to ask, which is, now, you, where are my questions here? You read your own audiobooks. So, when you were writing, so you, you did that for The Safe Place, so you, you knew you'd be reading the audiobook for The Shadow House. Did that influence the writing? Were you thinking about the characters' voices when you were creating this cast of characters and when you were writing The Shadow House? Um, I don't think specifically in terms of writing it for audio, like what is this going to sound like kind of thing. But I do think that it's helpful um, when crafting dialogue, particularly. I think it forces you to um to interrogate your dialogue and to create something you know to challenge yourself to create something really fresh because you know it will be spoken and if you are the person that has to speak it you're like well I, I you know I, I have to make this realistic so I speak a lot of you know when I'm writing those dialogue scenes I speak a lot of those conversations out loud I sort of play the characters so to speak just to right. kind of see how how that might um translate if if it you know were read on audio or or if it was a play um I I know that Tana French does something similar I read that she said once in an interview that she does she does something similar and she says to herself well if I was an actress given that line would I want to say that on stage and if the answer is no then it, it's not in there it goes um so I think it's it's really helpful it was helpful writing this book particular to have had that experience um and I think it makes you more aware of your rhythms as well um and particularly when it comes to rounding out your chapters, you know, if you're reading your work aloud, which I would recommend anyone to do, even if they're not, you know, going to ultimately read their own audio book. But if you're reading it aloud, you can feel where the natural end is to a chapter. Um, and you can feel if it's not quite finished. You can feel if it needs something else. And I think it's, it's a different feel to when you're reading it on the page you know, like reading it silently, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. That's so interesting. And when we, you and I have talked before about how your, how your acting career has influenced your writing. And I think that is, you know, what, uh, why your scenes are so powerful and so gripping is I think that you are sort of embodying them as, as you're writing them, but you're drawing on that expertise that you developed in, in your earlier career. And so that's all coming through on the page. And I think that's, you know, that you were describing that scene with her, uh, Alex watching this video of her son, you know, and her son's not there. She's just discovered this thing and she's watching it. And it's it's so powerful, it's so gripping. Okay, one more question. I've got one more question, guys. And then I'm gonna let you ask all your <laughs> questions. Tracy's gonna, Tracy's gonna handle the Q&A. But first, I just wanna know, Anna, do you have some recommendations for other debut writers, other new books coming out that you would like to share with our uh, fabulous reading audience today? Yeah, I um, oh, there are so so many. I think at the moment we've got some, we've got some fantastic debuts coming up, coming out. Particular, uh, I I'm really excited to read Danuka McKenzie's The Torrent. She's so lovely, and I've been you know kind of I've known her for a little while now, so I'm I'm so excited for that book to come out. And can I just say, actually, when you were speaking about, you know, writing about motherhood and writing about, you know, Kara as, as, as the baby, as a character, mm. uh, Danuka McKenzie had her launch last night for the torrent and she was talking about, you know, bringing motherhood onto the page, showing the reality of what a working mother's life is like. Yeah. So I think there are, like, I think there is a really interesting intertextual conversation happening between these two books. Amazing. So, yes. Oh, I can't wait to read it. Um, and that's yeah. I, I she's she's got this fabulous um, pregnant detective protagonist, which I think is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, she she she's not going to be able to run down the street after the the whoever it is. I don't know if she has to run at any point in the book, but I'm imagining like she's going to waddle. You know, she's 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 going to need to pee a lot. You know, like there's so many things about 
you know, pregnancy and working motherhood. I'm so glad that they're starting to come to the forefront a bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of debuts, um, what else would I recommend? Um, oh, uh, I'm really excited to read, um, Love and Virtue. It's getting a lot of, um, it's very visible at the moment. I've heard some really great things about that. And there are some absolutely off the charts, brilliant books around at the moment that are discussing consent, particularly, and that interrogate um, maybe storytelling as, you know, the, the accepted ideologies, the, the, the things that we accept about storytelling, it, it maybe challenge them a little bit more. And, and you know, as, as with the case of bringing uh, motherhood to the fore, that kind of, you know, like, why don't we have more mothers with, with children doing incredibly exciting, fun things in books? Like, why? Equally with, you know, um, Jacqueline Bublitz's book, um, uh, Before You Knew My Name, that was one of the best things I've read recently. Absolutely incredible um, because it challenges that notion that we have, you know, um, why are there so many crime books about dead women? Why do we find that so interesting? Why, why is that an acceptable thing? Why are there so many Netflix dramas that begin with a very pretty, usually white, dead woman? What's that? You know, there, there's, there's a lot. Of, of books that are, are starting to interrogate those things. Um, yeah, so look, plenty that I'm excited about. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, I have more questions, but I see that we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy, who's gonna leave you through the Q and A. So uh, thank you for your questions, everyone. And thank you, Anna, for answering. Thank so you, <laughs> what a great chat, loved it. <laughs> yeah, you've been wonderful together, Must I must add. And I've sat here listening to your both of your gorgeous accents. Oh, yeah. I forget. I forget. Now you're going to get my have. Aussie drawl yeah. joining in. Beautiful. Love it. Poetry Love it. to my ears. Okay. Let's have a look at some of these questions. So do you remember the first time you encountered a plot twist in a story? And what's, what's one of your favourite plot twists? Weirdly, yes. The first time I encountered a plot twist in a book was Matilda. And it was really powerful. Um, I remember reading it a long well, like I used to force my friends to read it with me like but reread it and I remember I've got a really vivid memory of being at a friend's house in in England lying down in in her garden on grass with face to face lying on our bellies with our feet in the air reading this book and we would flip over the page at the same time when you find out that Miss Trunchbull is Miss Honey's aunt and I was like oh, get out of town and we'd just you know the thrill of being uh, of being told something that momentous in a story um was yeah amazing for uh, my young reading mind yeah awesome and which was your favorite paranormal activity movie the first one the first one just blew my mind could not could not handle that at all and like I said it's very rare if I can't handle a scary movie I love to be scared um but yeah the, the first one that I, I did watch I think I watched two and three as well and they're, they're, they're also brilliantly done uh, but I think you know when, once you've um once you've seen one it kind of takes the edge off a little bit like the first time I watched that that first one I was just and the first time I watched uh, Blair Witch Project as well I, I remember seeing it in a, a cinema in Manchester and just coming out like shaking because it was so powerful and so so um, it just felt so real mm. yeah I agree I remember uh, having nightmares for about a week after that Blair Witch Project but the second one was very disappointing I find I don't think I saw it. I've got no memory of seeing it. So if I did, it's not made an impact yeah, at all. It's probably not um, one to rush out for. Fine. Just, just, just yeah, just saying. Just uh, <laughs> also, how has your career as an actress informed your writing career, if at all? Well, I've talked a little bit about how it affects the actual writing. I think in terms of career, um, 
I learned a lot of lessons that I've brought forward with me. Um, particularly, I, I talk about a lot how um, I think that as an actor, it's very difficult to separate your creative product from yourself. So the rejection is feels very personal. Um, also, what you're selling is your physical body and your appearance. And there's only so much you can do with that. And so if somebody rejects you, 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 you do feel like you are not enough or you are not good enough. Uh, whereas that's not true with being an author. I, I feel very freed up creatively because what I put out there is very separate to me. And I, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing that I can put the book away in my office and I can walk away from it. Or like, you know, if it gets a bad review, um, I don't feel necessarily that I am being reviewed. Um, I'm feeling like the book is being reviewed and then I can put that, that book in, you know, away in the past and I can start again on another one. Um, Mm -hmm. I think as well, uh, I, again, something that I, I tend to talk about a lot is uh, learning about learning really strong and important lessons about re- resilience, professional resilience, and um, uh, not comparing yourself to anybody else. Uh, if, if, if I start feeling like I'm comparing myself to somebody else, uh, I know that way lies madness. My, my, my solution to that is... Um, embrace embrace what that person has done go and find out more about it support it read about it you know shout shout about books that you love um don't don't and again it's about fear isn't it you know um if somebody else seems ostensibly to be doing better than you are or you know like somebody's um book has received more praise or has received better reviews on goodreads than you whatever uh there's that fear you feel like uh relatively speaking you're being diminished you're getting smaller you're you're uh you're somehow less but there is only you know really when it comes down to it your career is only made up of you and your words um it it has nothing to do with anybody else and i i think that's quite easy to um integrate personally um, into your career when you're a writer as well because I mean you would expect all writers are also readers and as readers we want stories to be read we want them to find their readers so if you read a really great book you 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 know even if your instinct is oh I'm not going to tell anybody to read that because it's going to get way better reviews than my book you can't help it you can't help but like sit in a pub with somebody and go, oh my God, I just read the most amazing book. And then you just want that book and that person to succeed. So um, I do feel like it's a health, for me anyway, it's just a healthier job to have. Uh, and I, I have learned a hell of a lot of lessons. I think also uh, just quickly that, you know, um, again, with that separation of, of you and your creative product, that with that comes... Um, a lot less emphasis on on ego your ego is not not as involved and that's really important I think to create good work right um there's an, another question here from Yasuko do you get any inspiration from actual crime for your story oh yes oh my god all the time I think you know um that's where that's where ideas come from is is you read the news or you hear something on the news and and then you can't stop thinking about it for days afterwards. Or uh, for me, it's often I'll read something or I'll hear about something and um, I, I will sort of almost become obsessed with a particular uh, viewpoint or, or a person and I'll start thinking, what would that be like? But like really, really like, not, not in a cliched sense, what's the lived experience of that? Um, and often it's not necessarily... Uh, the criminal themselves or even like the lead detective it's like maybe the the, the friend or, or the like with um Jacqueline Bublitz's novel that I, I was talking about before uh, before you knew my name that actually focuses on on the victim uh after death so the victim is is kind of talking to you after she's died and then the other viewpoint is the person that found the body and that to me is so interesting that you're you know you're kind of looking at a particular, uh, 
you know, and a murder, but from the viewpoints of these people that don't often get to have a voice. So I, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm interested by that, but oh, all the time, all the time I hear about real true crime and, uh, and just kind of become obsessed with, with certain things, um, with this new book that I'm writing, my, my third book, um, there's a particular kind of true crime story that, uh, I'm just absolutely fascinated with. It's not very well known, but, um, yeah, that's definitely been an influence, but I think we, you know, all crime writers are heavily influenced by, by true crime. Well, we look forward to you joining us to introduce us to that story when it's done. So, Yay. Uh, so we have one last question here. It's actually from Jonathan Butler, who's actually, funnily enough, our next guest on Library Through the Lens in April. Oh, so really? Jonathan, yeah, he says, did, did you have any lively debates with your editor about a character or plot line? <laughs> <laughs> I think Jonathan's Only from firm. a writer. That's a writer's question. Well, that one. And he's, he's an affirm um author I think because well, he is so I think he's that's a loaded question because he might be <laughs> asking me uh, about somebody that we both know rather well um <laughs> always lively debates about uh books in in the editing process um I find the collaboration with my editors I have I have um an editor in the US and an editor here in Australia um and we all kind of work together. I also have my agents who, who give me feedback as well. Um, we have loads of really interesting debates, but as I said, that, that, that collaboration is so important to me and so exciting and so invigorating and energizing. I just love it so much. Um, how it often goes is, um, you know, they'll give me a note and they'll, you know, I'll have worked so hard on this one thing and, and they'll say, I'm really sorry, but I don't think it, it works yet and I think maybe you might want to try this and I'll go in, in my head not to them I'll, I'll kind of say no that's a terrible idea I'm not doing that that's ridiculous and then I'll give it a couple of days and then I'll start really thinking about it and eventually almost always I'll be like yeah that's probably a really good point yeah I probably should do that but it's not always the subject that you know the that the solution is not always the thing that that they have put forward you know sometimes there's a kind of something that we haven't considered that that we can get to through uh, um, discussion and give or everybody giving ourselves a couple of days to kind of let these these thoughts and ideas percolate and then coming back together throwing it around again I just love it so much um I've never had any kind of uh, real lively debate like an argument or anything um I feel very uh very supported and encouraged and nurtured by by my editors um they Martin at a firm always says to me you're the boss you're the boss you're the boss you do what you you know which is kind of scary because you know uh, I think all most writers are very familiar with imposter syndrome and you know we often tell ourselves who am I you know don't don't let don't give me the decision like who am I to, to do this I'm, I'm nobody but you are you're you're the one uh, at the helm and um, your team and your editors uh, are the exalted experienced professionals who are able to give you the a viewpoint uh, that you won't be able to see so together through these lively discussions you can find the gold I think the, co yeah, the collaboration is just one of the best things about the job awesome well that's all the questions we have from the audience Ashley so I don't know if you had anything else before we wrap up this morning oh my gosh wow uh what do you have just any simple writing advice for anyone in the audience thinking about starting a novel just what would be your, your first couple tips for... To, to get started for the yeah. first time? Yeah. Well, uh, I would say go nuts. Enjoy. <laughs> um, just just start. Just start. I think the, the, the hardest thing is is starting. Just just put pen to paper and know that probably what you will write will, will not be very good. That's okay. That's fine. Um, uh, even when you know, writers have got many books under their belt the first time that they start a new project. It's, it's, it's usually not very good. Um, and that's okay. That, that's good. That gives you a place to start from. Um, I would say learn, educate yourself, 
Um, there's so much information out there. There's so much online about how stories work. I know that sounds a bit like, you know, go find out like how stories work. Like, but, but even again, even if you've got lots and lots of books under your belt, you're still able to find out new information about how stories work and, and, and why certain things work great on the page. There's just so many um, books and websites and, and um, courses that you can do that are really interesting. And, you know, you don't have to take all the advice. In fact, don't take all the advice because there's a lot of differing advice. But what you can do is, uh, you know, through that learning process, find out what chimes with you and what makes sense to you. Um, and I would say also, if you really, really want to write, you have to prioritize it as, as um, you know, you, you have to devote time to it. And um, that's not always easy, but it, it is necessary, um, you know, quite often, it's like me in the gym you know I kind of go oh, I don't have time I don't have time but if I really wanted to go to the gym I would make time and I would I would push something else out the way um but I don't <laughs> so it's you know if if you want to write you have to write you have to go and write you have to put pen to paper you have to sit down at the computer and you've got to learn you've got to learn your craft and it's you know the the, the learning is um part of the reward it's so fun mm -hmm. yeah Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. That, what a great, what a great chat. Thanks, Ash. Oh, oh no, thank that you, was so, it was all you. It was all you make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for the questions as well. It was so nice. So nice to have you all here. Great. Yeah. So thank you so much to both Anna and Ashley for joining us today and for sharing your book with us. Just before we go to quickly um, on the uh, subject of wonderful thrillers, Ashley, you were telling me before that you've you're writing a psychological thriller at the moment. I am. I am. Yes. I'm. Uh, yes. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it'll be. It won't be out this year. It'll hopefully be out 2023. But my first, my very first book, my name is Revenge, includes is part is part thriller based on based on true events, based on uh, the assassination of the Turkish consul general here in Sydney in Dover Heights in December 1980, which is still an unsolved crime. And there's now a million dollar reward for information about the people who committed that crime. And the last year the police were out in their scuba gear diving around Sydney Harbor because they got a tip and they recovered items from the water 40 years later, which I, I can only think had to have been the weapons. They must be the weapons. Like what else could they have recovered? So yeah, very intriguing. So yeah. the crime has always been my passion, not committing Excellent. it, just, just writing about it. <laughs> yeah. And I can't wait to read your book, uh, Anna, and see what's in those mystery boxes off the dark web. I'm intrigued. Yes. Great. Enjoy. I really hope you like it. Yeah. <laughs> so Anna's book can be purchased from any good local bookstore or, of course, can be borrowed from your library. And please uh, follow the Marion Library's Facebook page, the City of Marion website, and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations and workshops. And as I mentioned earlier, if you haven't already registered, please join us on the 5th of April for our next Library Through the Lens webinar with author Jonathan Butler as he talks Yay. about his historical non-fiction work, The Boy in the Dress, that was more than 10 years in the making. So that should be um, a great talk with Jonathan. And we do hope you'll join us in. And thank you once again, guys, for joining us and also to our audience. Thank you. Thank, thank you great. so much. Thanks, Tracy. Session. Thank you.